This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are again in front of Dr. Watson's cheery fireplace. A bitter December wind makes us glad to be inside, toasting our toes and listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure. What's it to be tonight, Dr. Watson? Well, now, let me see. Tonight, I think I'll tell you how Holmes' arch enemy, the diabolical Professor Moriarty, came close to disrupting the Queen's Diamond Jubilee festivities. You mean the celebration that marked the 60th year of the reign of Queen Victoria? Right. On that occasion, London was a mecca for adventurers and thieves drawn by the many visiting potentates and notables, all wearing their most fabulous jewels and elegant trappings. And, um, oh, by the way, speaking of glad rags, as you Yankees call it, Aren't you, um, rather dressy yourself tonight, Mr. Harris? I wondered how long before you'd notice my new suit, Dr. Watson. Mm, not bad. Stand up, let's have a look. Yes, not bad at all. Uh, is it... Uh... You mean, is it a Clippercraft suit? You bet it is, Doctor. Now I know why my friends say Clippercraft means what the well-dressed man will wear if he wants to get his money's worth. Yes, I wonder if I spoke to Santa Claus, I'd find something like that in my stocking. Eh? All I can say is there's nothing the average male would rather find under the Christmas tree than a Clippercraft suit. But the mystery to me is, how do they manage to turn out that handsome rig at the price? Well, Dr. Watson, that mystery doesn't take a Sherlock Holmes to solve. Here's how Clippercraft makes it easy for a man to look his best on Christmas morning and hundreds of mornings thereafter. It's through the Clipper Craft Plan, which concentrates the buying power of 924 leading stores across the nation, making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. The plan brings you the finest clothes at prices far less than you expect to pay at your own local independent store at the store you can trust. Beautifully tailored Clipper Craft suits are only $40 and $45. Top coats and overcoats are only $40. Yes, indeed. The friends who drop in on Christmas Day will think your clothes cost twice as much. For Clipper Craft values are so amazing, we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, supposing we get back to Her Majesty's Diamond Jubilee and the gentleman who tried to spoil the celebration. Yes, well, uh, all London was on fate, Mr. Harris. The festivities were endless. Garden parties, concerts, parades. The entire city was in a holiday mood. All but my friend Sherlock Holmes. He had drawn the blinds to shut out the brilliant spring sunshine and lay moping on the sofa, morosely pulling apart the tassels of his ancient dressing gown. Oh, for heaven's sake, Holmes... Buck up and stop uh, strewing bits of silk all over the carpet. You look as if you were molting. Everyone else is overjoyed at the celebrations. Leave me alone. I'm having my own private celebration. Oh, what are you celebrating in this particularly lugubrious fashion? Watson, do you realize it's just six years since Professor Moriarty and I pushed each other into the Reichenbach Falls? He never came back, poor chap. Well, you're not going to tell me you're sorry you finally reached society of that monster. No, I suppose not. But think what an occasion of this sort would have meant to him. Theatres and ballrooms fairly dripping with jewels. Intrigue and cabals on every street corner. But a veritable El Dorado for a master criminal like Professor Moriarty. And what's happened? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, you, you might give Scotland Yard some credit. They've been working night and day to protect the holidaymakers. Scotland Yard? How would Scotland Yard have prevailed against a mastermind like Moriarty? Yes, the one antagonist I ever found who was my mental equal... Army. Oh, well, you forget if you hadn't finished him, he'd have finished you. 
We ought to thank your lucky stars. He's gone instead of moping about like a dying duck. See what it is, Watson. That's a good fellow. Inactivity. That's wrong. What's wrong with you, Holmes? If you've engaged in any normal occupation, you... Oh, yes. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Hudson. There's a letter for you, Holmes. Mrs. Hudson says it was delivered by hand. Probably some female whose pet poodle has eloped with someone else's spaniel. I'm not interested. Purple letter paper addressed in a large, scrawling hand. There's a strange sort of crisscross in the upper left-hand corner of the envelope. What's that? Watson, give me that envelope. Well, all right, you needn't snatch it out of my hand. By all that's holy, that's not a double crisscross. It's a letter M. Watson, it's Professor Moriarty's handwriting. Oh, you're off your head, Holmes. This Moriarty business has become an obsession. I need a fix. You'd better go out in the fresh air and get some exercise, or you'll be imagining that you see him... Shut up, Watson, and listen to this. To the world's greatest detective, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Warning. At least he doesn't underrate me, eh, Watson? Oh, go to blazes. You will doubtless be astounded to learn I am alive. I managed to survive our little personal encounter in Switzerland, not without sustaining physical damage which kept me in the hospital for over a year. The remainder of the time which has intervened since we last met has been spent in building myself a new organization... You destroyed my last one, if you remember. I shall not soon forgive you for that. You doubtless look on yourself as society's protector. You are wrong. I like that. Don't interrupt, Watson. The more I am thwarted, the greater is my thirst for revenge on society. I have held my hand long enough. From today forward, look out for me. I shall begin this afternoon by staging a daring jewel robbery in the Strand. Tonight, a certain lady at the command performance in Albert Hall will lose her famous emeralds. Tomorrow and the day after, I shall perpetrate some new outrage. He's ranting like a madman. And last but not least, you and your colleague, Dr. Watson, will be put out of the way. What? I take pleasure in advising you of the fact that your hepatitis friend, Dr. Watson, will be the first to go. Signed, Moriarty. So, I'm to be the first. (laughs) It doesn't frighten me, the old babble-headed blowhard. Oh, I say, Holmes, uh, what is hepatitis? Hepatitis, my dear Watson, means... Rather blunted mentally. Oh, it does, does it? What's happening at Albert Hall tonight, Watson? I believe it's a concert by Adelina Patty. Everyone will be there. You weren't thinking of attending, I suppose. Why not, Watson? Why not? Uh, You might tell Mrs. Hudson to shake the camphor out of our evening clothes. I wonder if I have a clean, stiff shirt. Dash it all. It seems to be the difficulty, Watson. Oh, everything's shrunk. My collar, my waistcoat, even my evening pumps. Why is it when anything's laid away in mothballs for a few months, it inevitably comes out a size smaller? It couldn't be because you've grown a size larger, I suppose. Oh, shut up. I... There, you see? You see what happens when I lose my temper? What? I just popped another button. I suggest you descend to the kitchen and allow Mrs. Hudson to repair the damage. Oh, no. Now what? It sounds like one of your confounded clients. Don't worry, I'll get rid of him in short order. Better take the back stairs down to the kitchen, Watson. You don't want to be caught in uh, disarray in case the client is a lady. Oh, good Lord. (laughs) Flowers that bloom in the spring trolley. Come in. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes? I am Hector Pomfret of Pomfret, Pomfret and Smog. We're the best-known jewellers in London, Mr. Holmes. By appointment to His Highness, the Prince of Wales, no less. Of course. Of course. You have a shop in the Strand and you've just been robbed. But, but, Mr. Holmes, how did you know? It happened less than an hour ago. My dear Mr. Pomfret, I have rather special sources of information. (laughs) It's incredible. I haven't informed anyone, not even the police. You see, some of the stolen jewels weren't my property... Lady Biddlesford's pearls, for instance. Uh, she said they'd be restrung. Then, of course, the uh, great Burmese ruby. I had that on consignment. I practically sold it to that wealthy Mrs. Tecumseh Jones from Denver. Oh, it'll ruin my business if they're not recovered. Pity. But it's outrageous that such a thing should be allowed to happen in a civilized country. And in broad daylight. What's happened in broad daylight? The Strad, where did you come from? And what in thunder do you mean bursting in on us like this? Mr. Pomfret, I understand you've been burgled. I've come to see about it. I'm Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. Well, I don't want you. Go away. You may not want me, Mr. Pomfret, but your partner, Mr. Smart, does. He's the one that sent for me. He told me where you'd popped off to, so I came round to make sure you didn't get any bad advice. Thank you, Lestrade, for the vote of confidence. And now suppose you sit here quietly while Mr. Pomfret tells me just what occurred. Well, Mr. Holmes, I was in the shop alone. 
It was getting late and I was about to lock up when a nice, respectable, youngish man walked in the door. He wore a Prince Albert, carried a silver-headed malacca stick, a small black satchel, and had just the suggestion of a limp. Pardon me, you're Mr. Pomfret, I believe. Why, yes. Is there something I can do for you, sir? I was on the point of locking up, but if there's anything no, you no, want... No, 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 nothing very important, I'm afraid. I, I've just broken the crystal of my watch. I'm a doctor, you see, and my watch is a rather important bit of equipment in my profession. Of course, I understand. Well, I'll see if we have a crystal to fit. If you don't mind waiting a moment. No, no, not at all. I amused myself by looking at the handsome baubles in this uh, showcase here. <laughs> They're more than baubles, I assure you, Mr... Uh... Watson, Dr. Watson. Well, that ruby in the middle is worth a king's ransom, as they say. Very. Oh, yes, here we are. This crystal's perfect fit. Just a slight bit of pressure, so... And there we are. Here's your watch, Dr. Watson. The charge will be two shillings. Keep the watch. It served its purpose. I prefer the ruby and the other baubles. What, what, what do you Stand mean? Stand back or you'll be cut by flying glass. Why, Dr. Watson, put down that case. Oh, stop him. I'm being robbed. Stop me. Stop! But quick as a flash, he'd snatched the contents of the showcase, ran out the door, and was lost in the crowds. Showing no signs of a limp, I take it, Mr. Pomfret. Why, no, Mr. Holmes. The limp certainly wasn't in evidence he ran out of the shop. Leaving his watch behind? Yes, I brought it with me. I've heard you can deduce a man's entire history from his watch. Well, here it is. Interesting. Very interesting. The thing that interested me about Mr. Pomfret's story was the thief's name. Watson. Dr. Watson. My dear Lestrade, you don't suppose any jewel thief is going to be foolish enough to give his right name? I'm not so sure. What did he look like, Mr. Pomfret? Oh, I don't know. Not bad looking. A bit above medium height. Military moustache. Slightly grey at the temples. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think that'll hold if I don't take a deep breath. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, as a matter of fact, the thief looked very much like... Oh, no, by Jove. He was this gentleman who just came in. Well, what thief are you talking about now? Oh, good evening, Lestrade. How's the Scotland Yard's prize watchdog, eh? Uh, Holmes, my watch. Where on earth did you find it? Well, you left it, Dr. Watson, in my shop when you smashed my showcase and made off with a Burmese ruby. Not to mention Lady Biddleswood's pearls. Holmes, what's the man raving about? As if you didn't know. So, you turned thief, eh, Dr. Watson? This association with Sherlock Holmes is responsible, no doubt. I've always suspected you two were both sides of the street. What's this all about, Holmes? Has everyone gone mad? I think I can explain the confusion, Watson. You'll not talk your way out of it this time, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. We've got the goods on your friend, Dr. Watson. Mr. Pomfret has made a positive identification. <laughs> I've been looking forward to using these handcuffs on you chaps. For heaven's sake, Lestrade, sit down and try not to be a bigger fool than the Lord intended. Right. It's all so perfectly simple. Here. Read this letter I received this morning and see if you can comprehend what danger we're really in. It'll take more than a letter. Shut to... up and read it. Now then, Watson, when did you first miss your watch? Why, uh, let me see it. Uh, it was this morning when I wanted to take Mrs. Hilton's pulse. I, I was positive I slipped it into my pocket when I dressed this morning, but I suppose I left it behind on the bureau. I sometimes do, you know. No, Watson, you took it with you. Remember you told me the times you were about to leave? That's right. So I did, but... Then how did it get here? The watch was lifted from your pocket by one of the light-fingered gentry in Moriarty's employ. Later this afternoon, it was used by another gentleman who impersonated you and robbed the jewelry shop of Mr. Pomfret here, leaving the watch behind to incriminate you. Why, oh, the blackguard, the filthy blackguard, why, I've been in the entire afternoon. You, why, you can give me an alibi, Holmes. Naturally, he's in coach. If you won't believe me, Lestrade, perhaps you'll take Mrs. Hudson's word. She spent the afternoon letting out Dr. Watson's dress shirt and fitting it to his person. But this is incredible, fantastic. The thief was exactly like your friend, Mr. Holmes. All this hanky-panky about Professor Moriarty in his outfit. I never even seen the man. How do I know there is such a person? We'll just have to take my word for it, Lestrade. Incidentally, we shall miss the first part of the concert at Albert Hall unless we hurry. Oh, good Lord, and I have to rush home and dress. I'm sitting in Mrs. Tecumseh Jones's box, you know. Who cares? I shall have to go to keep an eye on those blasted tiaras, I suppose. Ha! I hate music. I know, but you wouldn't want to miss the professor's next robbery. Come along, Lestrade. (laughs) 
Yes, Watson, I think we shall station ourselves here at the foot of the grand staircase. Whose emeralds do you think Moriarty is after? I don't know. It could be the Maharani of Saiba or the Bolivian millionaire, Senora Boldaro. Ah, here comes Lestrade. He looks agitated. What's up, Lestrade? Anyone purloined the crown jewels? These stupid women. Already Baroness von Ockfeld has lost an expensive brooch and two of Madame de Ranciville's diamond bracelets are missing. Sounds as if Moriarty's minions were warming up for the main event. Rubbish. It's these fool females. Never make sure the catches are properly closed. By Joe Holmes, look. Look at that enormous red-headed woman coming in the carriage entrance. She looks like an animated Christmas tree. That's enough to blind you. Yes, that's Mrs. Tecumseh Jones, the American. She has more jewels than most of the crown heads of Europe. Yes, and most particularly, she has an emerald necklace that makes the Maharani's and the Senoras look like something at the vicar's tea party. I see. Look who's beside her, the, the little pipsqueak. Yes, it's Mr. Hector Pomfret, so he didn't keep her waiting after all. Must be a quick change artist, eh, Watson? Uh, she seems to be giving him what for. Here they come. Lestrade, I suggest you proceed them to her box while Dr. Watson and I bring up the rear. Those emeralds certainly deserve a guard of honor. Yes, and I'm pretty mad at you, Pomfret. But my dear Mrs. Jones. You knew doggone well I wanted that ruby. But I assure you, Mrs. Jones, it was stolen. Stolen in broad daylight. Don't make me laugh. Some other woman offered you a better price. But you're not kidding me. Dear Mrs. Jones, I assure you the jewel was stolen. Word of honor. Uh, evening, Lestrade. Oh, good evening. This is Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard, Mr. Jones. He'll tell you I was robbed. Uh, look here, Mr. Pomfret. I wonder if you could persuade Mrs. Jones to make sure all her jewel catches are in working order. Young man, I'm quite capable of taking care of my own affairs. Come on, Pomfret. Yes, Mrs. Jones. Hey, get off of my train. Watson. I wasn't anywhere near the silly thing. Well, someone tried to trip me up. Golly, Ned. My necklace! My emerald necklace! It's gone! Somebody stole it! I've been robbed! I've been robbed! Here, hold still, everybody. Don't move. A hand! I felt someone's hand on the back of my neck. Then the necklace was gone. Where did it go to? Not very far, I assure you. No one has moved. Whoever took it's within arm's reach. Now, I was on one side of you, Mr. Pomfret on the other, and Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson were directly in back. In back! That's where I felt his hand! On the back of my neck. It's that Dr. Watson. He robbed my shop, but I let him talk me out of it. You renegade. You blackguard. Let go of me, you idiot. I didn't touch the emeralds. The silly things probably fell off. A likely story. Well, well, all right. Search me if you don't believe it. I dash well will. That's right. Search him. What's that bulge in his left-hand pocket? <laughs> the emeralds. And more besides. Would this be your ruby, Mr. Pomfret? And Lady, uh, what's her name's pearls? Yes, uh, this is the Ockbelt brooch and the missing diamond bracelets as well. Quite a haul, Watson. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, does it? Dr. Watson, you're under arrest. But, 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 this is preposterous. It's outrageous. Holmes, don't just stand there like a ninny. For heaven's sake, do something. What is there to do, my dear Watson? Uh, better go quietly. Yes, as things stand, I think jail may be the safest place for you. Holmes! <laughs> Inspector Lestrade. Up and about early, aren't you, after last night's festivities? Uh, Patty was in excellent voice, didn't you think? I didn't listen. I was busy seeing no more jewels were stolen. Even with Dr. Watson safely under lock and key? As a matter of fact, oh, several other pieces did turn up missing. The Duchess of Wentworth's tiara and Lady Mulder's diamond stomacher. Oh? Huh? Uh, look here, Elves. You don't think it's possible those jewels were planted on Dr. Watson? Lestrade... You astonish me. Every now and then you show signs of intelligence. Oh, By the way, I had a further communication from Professor Moriarty this morning. Like me to read it to you? I don't suppose I could stop you. Quite. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, yesterday's exploits were so successful in spite of my advance warning, I think I shall let you in on my further plans. I rather enjoy watching your feeble attempts to prevent my activities. That's a wrap at you too, you know, Lestrade. Uh, go on. I shall arise betimes, for this morning I shall rob the Sailors and Merchants Bank. At 9, the Merchants Guild will receive my attention. At 11.15, I shall relieve Lily Langtry of her sapphires. I shall then take two hours off for lunch. The music at the Savoy is so refreshing, you know. 
At two, Baroness Traphagen's famous cameos will be missing. At four, Mortimer Brewster, the American millionaire, will find it convenient to pay me a hundred thousand pounds to cover up a few little irregularities in his shipping business. Then I shall go home for a bit of a nap, a late dinner, and then the grand finale. Well, what's he got up his sleeve for this evening, the blighter? I shall spend the evening at Buckingham Palace, where Her Majesty is giving a ball. All the best people will be there. I do hope you can manage to come, my dear Holmes, for at twelve midnight I shall blow the whole place to kingdom come. Until then, au revoir. Signed, Moriarty. He's joking, of course. He must be joking. Blow up the palace. Good Lord, it's unthinkable. It's, 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 a, it's a nightmare. It's worse than that, Lestrade. It could very well be the twilight of the gods for the British Empire. You're joking, Holmes. I was never more serious in my entire life. Come in. Inspector Lestrade, sir. Scotland Yard sent me. They thought you ought to know, They're sir. They're what, Albert? And straighten your tunic. Yes, sir. The sailors and merchants' banks has been robbed, and the merchants' guild all has been set afire. You can't very well blame Watson for those calamities, Lestrade. Maybe we should have locked you up too, Holmes. Uh, but there's something else. What's that, Albert? Uh, Mr. Pomfret, sir. Mr. Hector Pomfret was found tied up this flat when his charlady come to work this morning, sir. Good Lord. The city says he's been tied up since he went home to dress for the concert last night, sir. But he was at the concert. I saw him with my own two eyes. No, Lestrade. You saw someone who impersonated Hector Pomfret. The same man who earlier impersonated Dr. Watson, I suspect. I was pretty sure it wasn't Pomfret himself. When he arrived so promptly, he hadn't had time to change, you know. And then, when I saw his ears, I was certain. His ears? What's that got to do with it? A good makeup can disguise any feature except ears. The ears on the man who escorted Mrs. Tecumseh Jones were not the ears I'd noticed on Mr. Pomfret earlier in the day. Whose ears were they, do you suppose? I rather imagine they belonged to Professor Moriarty. I'm convinced he spent the last few years studying the art of disguise. But then we wouldn't know him if we ran into him. I would, Lestrade. I should be looking for his ears tonight at the ball at Buckingham Palace. Uh, do you think you could manage to release Watson in time to accompany me? I hate to carry my own revolver. It destroys the fit of one's evening clothes, don't you know? You've seen clothes whose very appearance breathes fine quality. Graceful tailoring, perfect fit, rich, long-wearing materials. But unless you've worn Clippercraft clothes, you've never seen that kind of suit at only forty and forty-five dollars, or that kind of top coat or overcoat at only forty dollars. The quality so evident in Clippercraft clothes is made possible by the sensational Clippercraft plan. It concentrates the buying power of nine hundred twenty-four leading independent stores across the nation, bringing you the savings that result from this group buying. Yes, even clothing experts are amazed at these remarkable Clippercraft values. Clothes that are truly fine in every way at the price of ordinary clothes. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. like a ball at Buckingham Palace. Brings out the flower, flower of the empire, I always say. Quite a contrast to Bow Street Jail. Yes, I shall forgive you for that in a hurry, Holmes. <laughs> oh, here comes the straw, looking like a mother hen whose ducks have taken to water. Look here, Holmes. I can't help worrying that someone sneaked in that confounded bomb in an opera cloak or a, or a bustle. My dear Lestrade, I told you I'd taken care of that. Shinwell Johnson has provided us with the best pickpockets in the business. They're acting as coat room attendants. I promise you, every guest of this party has been thoroughly, if unobtrusively, gone over. 
Not a pocket handkerchief has been overlooked. And I've had my men frisk the staff. The great danger, of course, is the refreshments. Well, I've ordered supper served in tents at the opposite end of the grounds, like you suggested. If it's too far for the guests to walk, so much the better. They'll have to get along with the punch and champagne. And very nice champagne, too, I must say. Yes, the old widow of Windsor keeps an excellent cellar, God bless her. And keep her from harm. Amen. There's your Albert Lestrade. What's he carrying in that basket? Hey, Albert. Come here, lad. What's that you've got in the basket? I'm taking in a chicken and a bottle of wine to the boys, sir. There's to be no refreshment served here, and the boys are uncommon hungry. So we, Albert. Suppose you give us that basket. Very good, sir. Holmes, you're not going to have a picnic lunch here. A nice, plump chicken, Albert. And rather heavy. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Uh, get another chicken for the boys, sir. Oh, no, Albert. Stay here and share this one with us. Holmes! That chicken, it's sticking. Yes, Watson, it contains a very ingenious time bomb. When is it set to go off, Professor Moriarty? <laughs> At 12 o'clock, which is in exactly 30 seconds. You, you're not, Albert. Right, hang on to Lestrade. I'll take care of the bomb. There's no time, 30 seconds. Holmes, throw that chicken out of the window. It'll blow him to bits. Ah! The fool. <laughs> Why didn't he throw the bomb? Why did he have to run with it? Because you can only throw it about 50 feet. The explosion would be too close. It would start a panic. On the other hand, it's remarkable how far you can run if you've been a sprinter in your youth like home. Will it never be 12 o'clock? It's the longest 30 seconds of my entire life. If home... Calm yourself, madam. It's just the signal to start the fireworks. Yes, there goes the first Roman candle. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, it's Elms. so beautiful. Elms, where did you get rid of that bomb? I tossed it into the lake. It created quite a splash, but the water deadened the explosion. Uh, one more question, Elms. How in thunder did you know it wasn't Albert? By his ears. Albert's ears are what you might call outstanding. By Jove, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Well, Dr. Watson, that was certainly a case of never a dull moment with Sherlock Holmes. So that was the end of Professor Moriarty. <laughs> on the contrary, he managed to give Lestrade the slip on the way to prison... Secretly, I believe Holmes was so glad to have the scoundrel back, he was both relieved and delighted. And now, Dr. Watson, I wonder if you'd like to give us a hint about next week's story. Next week, I think I'll tell you about a friend of mine who married a beautiful young South American lady he had only known a few weeks. It wasn't long after he brought her home to England that his household began to suspect she was a vampire. A vampire? Good Lord, is there such a thing, Dr. Watson? Well, suppose you wait till next week, Mr. Harris, and find out. Hmm? The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockren with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Help save lives by buying Christmas seals. These seals support the fight against tuberculosis. Buy and use Christmas seals and mail your packages early. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Sussex Vampire. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Clippercraft clothes. 
This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.